exactly who you are in relation to NASA and what was your position there? What were you in charge of? Okay, Cheryl, actually there's several phases to my, uh, my history and background. Originally when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1966, I went to work for the Grumman Aerospace Corporation at uh, the, at the time it was called the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, later to be called Johnson Space Center. I was one of the five test pilots, consultant pilots for Grumman on the Lunar Module spacecraft and our job and responsibility was to be in, at the controls of the Lunar Module spacecraft at all times during 24 hours testing and at any time that one of the astronauts came on board uh, the spacecraft they had to be one of us test pilots on board to answer any question they might have and explain the use of any one of the 486 different switches, circuit breakers, gauges, dials inside that little spacecraft. I think it was a great experience. I was, as I said, the youngest uh, test pilot out of the group, so I, I uh, had a lot of fun working with all the different flight crews and all the way up through the Apollo 11. I took my first vacation while Apollo 11 was on the moon, and when I returned back to, uh, I went to New York, as a matter of fact, uh, where my uh, wife used to live. And when we came back to Houston, I went in to um, pick up my paycheck after two weeks being gone, and I was told, well, guess what? While you were gone, NASA cut the budget, and your job on the Apollo operation telescope. We were going to mount a telescope below the ascent stage of a lunar module and use it in conjunction with the Skylab to be able to be kind of like the Hubble was. Well, they cut the, the, the budget for that. I got laid off again. And uh, at that time, I turned around and went to work for the company called Brown and Root Northrop. They were the ones that had the contract to maintain and operate the facilities at uh, the Johnson Space Center. Well, other than the ordinary, the fact that there were more PhD scientists per square block at NASA in Houston than any place else in the world, it was terribly exciting to be a part of that. Uh, there were several instances that, that happened that I was first, had first-hand knowledge of and experience. And, um, first of all, let's go back and say what my responsibility was there at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. I, I was put in charge of the, a department which we called the Data and Photo Control Department, which meant I had to maintain and keep the archives of all of the uh, lunar photography, both uh, still photography as well as motion pictures from the command module as it circled the moon, and um, make available to the principal investigators and scientists around the world uh, copies and images of any of the samples that they might get, as well as uh, uh, targets of interest, as they call them. Now, uh, one particular incident, I was going over to the photo lab and checking out some uh, film strips. There was one particular scientist, he was the chief scientist in charge of astronomy, uh, and his name was Dr. Thornton Page. Now, Dr. Page had asked me to check out a particular film strip so that it could be shown to just he and a private showing between him and seven other of the uh, scientists that were there. This film was uh, taken from the command and service module as it circled the moon and as it was going around the back side of the moon uh, taking pictures. Now, at that particular uh, time during the mission, the moon was in what you would, well, you'd look up at the moon and say, well, it was a, it was a half moon looking from the Earth. Well, if it's a half moon, the, the sun is shining on half of it. That means it's shining on the back half, half of the back also. So as a result, this, we were approaching a crater. The film is, is that we're watching coming up on a crater by the name of Tsiolkovsky. Russians named most of the craters on the back side of the moon, as a matter of fact. But anyway, as we got close, um, the, the shadow portion of the crater being cast by the, the sun hitting the rim of the crater, casting a shadow down the bottom, there was a, a cluster, it looked like about five domes all clustered together down in this dark shadow portion of, of Tsiolkovsky, and it looked like something like a plume or a column sticking up above the, the crater rim. Uh, Dr. Page asked me, he said, Ken, freeze it. I was using what's called a gun sequence camera. This is what the military uses uh, on aircraft. Have you seen during World War II and whatever you, whenever an airplane's doing a dogfight and they're firing tracers, there's a gun sequence camera that's clicking off frames to get, to get the, uh, the film. The gun sequence camera would allow me to jump frame by frame or multiple frames, so stop, freeze, zoom in close, and it's actually used for f photo analysis of actually what, what they filmed. Um, so as we, we've approached Tsiolkovsky and we've got this cluster of lights down in the in the, in the darkened shadow area of it. Dr. Page says, freeze, stop, back up, he had me reverse two or three times, zoom in close on it, and then back, back up. He says, hold it, and he turned around to the other seven scientists and he looked at them, he says, well, boys, what do you think of that? And they all chuckled and laughed like it was an inside joke, like they knew what was there. Dr. Page then says, okay, Ken, go ahead and finish the reel. So I, I showed the rest of it as we continued the uh, traverse across the backside of the moon and came around for Earth rise, and that was the end of that strip. Uh, I had to take that film back to the photo lab 
and check it back in what we call uh, bondage storage. The photo lab, the back rooms of the photo lab were, were classified as secret. You had to have at least a secret clearance to get in there. So I took the film in, checked it in, left for the day. The next day I was to check out that same film and take it to uh, the main auditorium at NASA in Houston and show it for the rank and file engineers that were present there. Uh, I had two or three of my other friends show up with me because I wanted them to see what we'd found on the back side of the moon. And I set the film up, we're showing it, we're coming up on the Tsiolkovsky crater looking for the, sh the shadow area. The spacecraft obviously flew right over it and there was nothing in the bottom of the crater. I stopped the camera, told the audience, I said, I'm having technical difficulties. I checked the film to see if it had been cut and spliced. There were no cut and splices on it. Uh, the only answer I can give you is that in 24 hours from the time I checked it in to the bondage storage and checked it out, it had to have been taken out, cut, spliced, airbrushed out, spliced back in, and a whole duplicate reel made so that it was a smooth transition and it wasn't there. When I took the, the film back to the photo lab, as I was taking it in, there's this, um, what I call a light table. It's about four foot by four foot, and it, it was an opaque top and had a light down below it, and there were negatives on top, and there were two gentlemen and a woman that were sitting at, at the table, and they, some of them were painting, some of them were airbrushing, and I asked them what they were doing. And uh, the two gentlemen quipped very quickly. He says, oh, we're professional strippers. And I said, what do you mean? The lady says, no, what we're doing is we're stripping out and painting above the horizon because we don't want people to get confused by stars and things. And so we've been, we've been tasked to, to, to darken it out so that it doesn't distract from what people are looking at and they really want to see the moon. Well, I, that really kind of hit me. Now, that was strange. Why would we do that? Because, frankly, I, I like to look at the stars. It looks great. I checked the film in back into uh, the bonded storage then, and that was the, kind of the end of that episode. But it always kept gnawing on me. What? had caused that. What were they looking at? What were they brushing out? And, but if you remember back during the Apollo days, we were so pressed for completing one mission for the next mission, the next mission, and everyone doing their jobs and being a, a classified in a, a secret clearance. There are times when you're, you're told uh, you have to have a need to know. Well, I just figured it was something I didn't have a need to know and kind of just filed it in the background and said, well, okay, I'll look into that later. And as fate would have it, um, most of us got laid off before later came around for us to have a chance to look it up. Well, I did ask. I asked Dr. Page, and uh, Dr. Page's comment was, uh, there was never anything there. So, uh, and that was just kind of telling me to back off, I guess. Within about two months of that particular incident, a directive came down from NASA headquarters, where uh, through Dr. Michael Duke, who was the, the curator of lunar samples, from him, the direction came down to Bud Laskawa, who was my immediate supervisor, and I was directed by them verbally that I was to destroy all but one set.